Hello, everybody. We are so happy that you chose to join us again. Let us pray. Most holy and gracious Father, once again, we come asking that you would open our hearts and our minds to receive your fresh. Father, help us to not only be hearers of your word, but doers as well. Father, we thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. So we continue with article number 12, the harmony of the law and the gospel. And our author writes, we believe that the law of God is the eternal and unchangeable rule of his moral government, that it is holy, just, and good, and that the inability which the scripture ascribes to fallen men to fulfill its precepts arise entirely from their love of sin to deliver them from which and to restore them through a mediator to unfeigned obedience to the holy law is one great end of the gospel and of the means of grace connected with the establishment of the visible church. So we are continuing today with Galatians, the third chapter, verses 19 through 25. And so, uh, and this is the NIV version, and it reads, what then was the purpose of the law? It was added because of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. The law was put into effect through angels by a mediator. A mediator, however, does not represent just one party, but God is one. Is the law therefore opposed to the promises of God? Absolutely not. For if a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. But the scripture declares that the whole world is a prisoner of sin, so that what was promised being given through faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Before this faith came, we were held prisoners by the law, locked up until faith should be revealed. So the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. Now that faith has come, now that faith has come, we are no longer under the supervision of the law. So last time, uh, we made a feeble attempt to explain that Jesus did not do away with the law. There are many who think that Jesus' death destroyed the law. And now, and think that now we're under grace and, and to them, that means that they're free to pretty much act in any kind of way they please. And, and just, you know, just do whatever and then ask God for forgiveness and hey, he forgives you and that's about the end of that. Which is not true at all. Not even a little bit. Paul asked the question in Romans 6, 1 and 2, and this is the King James Version. Paul asked the question, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And then he answers the question, God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? One commentary that I read said, and I quote, he said, too many Christians are betweeners. They live between Egypt and Canaan, saved but never satisfied. Or they live between Good Friday and Easter, believing in the cross but not entering into the power and glory of the resurrection. That's about where we most of us live. We want to be saved, but we don't know what that means for our everyday lives. It's like church and and salvation is over here and life is over here and never the two meet but it, it, it's like i'm saved uh now what we we use it like a fire insurance policy it stays tucked away until the threat of fire then we pull it out to show that we have it we want to be free from obeying the law of Moses, but we also want to be free from obeying the law of God. We and, and we justify our thinking by saying that we're under grace, which is totally not the teaching of Jesus or Paul, who and, and Paul wrote 
the, a good portion of the New Testament. Under the Old Covenant or the Mosaic Law, it required strict obedience to the letter of the law. It required obeying the, the literal interpretation of the words, but not necessarily the intent of those words. The New Covenant of grace given by Jesus Christ is based on the spiritual intent of the law. It, 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 it is possible to obey the spiritual, uh, the spirit of the law and obey what God intended for the law to do and not necessarily stick with the literal wordings. For instance, when Jesus said in Matthew 5, 27 through 28. He, he said, you have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. Now, the law said, that's the, that's the law. The law, the law said, do not commit adultery. And, and if you obey just that, then you are obeying the letter of the law, which is the literal interpretation. You're not committing adultery. And that's good. But Jesus, who came as our spiritual law giver, giver he came and kind of magnified, amplified this thing. And, 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 and he magnified the laws of God. So Jesus came and, and he's like, hold up. Don't be so quick to pat yourself on the back. And he gives the intent, the spiritual intent of the law. So in verse 28, he says, but I tell you, that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery in her, in, with her in his heart. And might I add that it also hits us women, the same as men. Now, when Jesus said that, that changed the whole, <coughs> excuse me, dynamics. That ups the ante. That goes heart deep. That makes it personal. And Jesus says, that's the point. Jesus' life and ministry shows us that God requires obedience to his commandments, not only in the letter of the law, but in the spirit of the law as well. In fact, if one obeys the intent of the law or the spirit of the law, then the letter of the law is automatically obeyed. So clearly, Jesus' teachings make the law upfront and personal. And yet, some Christians looking for a loophole uh, to live any kind of lives, to live loose lives, think that Jesus came to abolish the law. But Jesus' teachings don't at all go along with that train of thought. Matthew, the fifth chapter, verse 17 and 8, says, and this is Jesus talking. He says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappears, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. So the question can be asked, how did Jesus fulfill the law and the prophets? Jesus Christ was and is our, pers our spiritual lawgiver. And as such, he fulfilled the law of God by bringing it to its full expression. It, it, he, he, he made it come alive. In other words, Jesus filled the law to the full by teaching obedience in the spirit of the law, by amplifying the meaning and the application of the law. That it, it's not just good to not commit adultery. That's good. But then he, he was like, no, you, you got to do more than that. You got to not, you got to control even your look. You got to control your lust. And, and so Jesus amplified the meaning and the application of the law. And, and so by doing that, Jesus just turned the scribes and the Pharisees' legalistic system. He just turned it upside down. See, it's easy to look down at folk 
that have been caught in a fault, especially when that fault is something that you are guilty of, but you have come just shy of being caught. And, 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 and even, you know, nobody has, but then when, well, when, when it comes to the heart thing, it, it puts you right along with them. In the fifth chapter of Matthew, Jesus took six Old Testament laws and opened the meaning to explain God's standards. He, he dealt with the attitudes and the intent of the heart and not with just what was performed on the outside. It, it's kind of like back when I was in school, you know, working hard problems. Uh, the teacher would always say, show your work. In, in other words, she would say, show how you arrive at your answer. Even if it was wrong, show how you arrived at it. And, and she would look at that thing and, and, and see your intent. E even, though, even though you went wrong somewhere, she saw your intent and would give you some credit for your efforts. And, and so Jesus here, he, deals with, he dealt with the attitude and the intent of the heart and not just what was performed on the outside. See, you can come up with the right answer in, in, the, in the math problem, but if you don't show your work, then you're not showing your heart in essence. And so the Pharisees said that righteousness consisted of performing certain actions. But Jesus said that righteousness centered in the attitude of the heart. When you think about it, it's easier to obey the letter of the law rather than the intent. It's easier to just not do a thing and, 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 and make it okay than to do it to, to, to do it in your heart. You know, it's easier, you know, to, to not do a thing. But when Jesus said you can't even do it in your heart, that just makes it even harder. When you think about it, it's just easier to obey the letter of the law rather than the intent of the law. And so whenever the heart is involved, actions are more intentional. Here, here's another example of what I mean. The law said, do not murder. Most of us got that covered. And we know that because there's more people not in prison than there are in prison, which means most of us are not committing murder. But when Jesus comes along and says that anger is murder in the heart, that magnifies that law. That puts it up close and personal. Listen to Matthew, the fifth chapter, verse 21 and 22 in the message version. It, it, he says, you're familiar with the command to the ancients. Do not murder. I'm telling you that anyone who is so much as angry with a brother or sister is guilty of murder. Carelessly call a brother idiot. And you just might find yourself hauled into court. Thoughtlessly yell stupid at a sister and you are on the brink of hellfire. The simple moral fact is that words kill. Wow. Now, I will ask the question, who among us are not guilty of murder? Note that Jesus did not say that anger leads to murder. He says that anger is murder. That's upfront and personal. That's all in your face. That steps on your toes. That, that just, it just messes with you. Now, for those of you who hold the philosophy, hold to the philosophy that, hey, if I'm already in trouble for just thinking it, then I might as well go ahead and do it. Jesus does not mean that we should go ahead and murder someone we hate. He's not saying go ahead and commit the act. He's saying we need to take it higher than just not doing it but we're doing it in our heart. So, you know, 
So he's not saying that since we've already sinned in our heart that we should go ahead and do it. And, and then Paul would say, God forbid. Sinful feelings are not an excuse to act, to do the actual deed. Our feelings won't send us to jail, but the actual deed will. In this teaching, Jesus magnified the laws and the commands of God. If Jesus had come to abolish the laws of God, he would not have magnified and expanded their meaning. He made them even more binding. He made them even more intentional. Now you've got to work harder at, 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 at not doing a thing uh, and, and work harder at keeping your heart right. Another meaning of the word fulfill in Matthew 5 and 17 is to complete or to bring to completion. So Jesus brought the physical rituals of the law to completion. You remember uh, in the Old Testament, all the different rituals that, that they had to do, the, the different sacrifices and all that that they had to do. Jesus came to bring the entire system of animal sacrifices. And aren't we glad about that because we wouldn't have any meat to eat. But he, he ended, he brought the entire system of animal sacrifices and and all the temple rituals and the laws, uh, you know, from the period of Aaron priesthood, he brought all of that to completion. Through his death, Jesus ended the old covenant, which had a system of rituals that the children of Israel had to keep. He replaced the old covenant by establishing the new covenant, which had a higher spiritual application. The sacrificial laws ended because of the uh, uh, a more superior sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Jesus was above all the rituals and all the sacrificing that was done. That was just a, a it, it was just a substitute until the real thing, until the real sacrifice came. The sacrifice of Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That superseded and replaced all the animal sacrifices and other physical rituals and ceremonies that were performed. And right now, loved ones, the passing of time has superseded the continuation of this lesson. So come back next time as we continue our study of the harmony of the law and the gospel. And until then, be blessed, be safe, take care, and hope to see you next time. Bye-bye.